today we're going to be talking about the spookiest thing of all, the scariest part of writing, editing. And it also just so happens to be that I am editing a spooky book. The only thing scarier than everything happening here is the fact that my glasses are so dirty. I can see the horror in front of me as opposed to just imagining it. Hello friends and welcome back to another video. My name is Katie and today I'm going to be talking about my editing process specifically because I line edited a book from my very good friend Wallace and I'm putting this out in October because it's a spooky book. It's a witchy book, not a demon horn book, but I don't have a witch's hat. There's also well, there's sort of ghosts, spirits. No skellies though, but I do enjoy the skellies. And to save me from the horror of it all is my emotional sports card. Just kidding, it's actually not that bad. So I was asked by Wallace to line edit her book, Tibifo. This book is for October. Before she sent it off to beta so that she could give it to her sister and it would be nicely line edited and not have any egregious mistakes in it. So I did get permission to make this video and we'll be talking about the very scary process of editing, whether it's for yourself or for someone else. This is my process when it comes to how do I tackle the big word known as editing. I basically have three questions that I ask myself before I actually start getting into it. The first question is, who? Who am I line editing for? Have I read this before? And three, what does the author want? Luckily for this edit, the first two questions are extremely easy because this is Wallace. Definitely know what I'm in for because I have read this book several times by now, so I know the story. It ends up making my job a lot easier because I'm already familiar with the story and the context of everything, so I'm not stumbling to figure out the world. And her style is also familiar to me, so I kind of know what to look for when I'm editing. The third question obviously is directed at the author, whether it be yourself or your client. And of course, this is something you always want to take into account. Wallace specifically wanted me to copy edit, line edit, and make sure the book was as fast paced and readable as possible. So I know from that that I need to focus on consistency, cleaning up messy sentences, and ensuring clarity. I know Wallace also worries about pulling her punches when it comes to romance, so if there's any place where I can bump up the romantic tension or add some more spooky atmosphere, she did give me permission to do that. So how do I actually address this amorphous list of concerns and actually edit? Well, first, the easiest thing and the most self-explanatory is to actually start reading the book. Luckily, I have a lot of the grammar rules inside my head already because I did get a degree in creative writing and literature, so I can just do them on autopilot without worry. I just see them and I fix them whenever I spot them. However, if you don't have this in your self-editing, you can install an extension of Grammarly onto Google Docs. I don't know if it fits anywhere else. I haven't put it on Scrivener because I do not want Grammarly fucking with my Scrivener. And it does actually catch a lot and is quite accurate with the very low level grammar rules. I will also link resources down below that I personally used in college if you would like to learn a little bit more about English grammar rules. Just a bit of light reading. I had you looking in the wrong section. How could I be so stupid? <laughs> I checked this out weeks ago for a bit of light reading. The second thing I do is I start a style guide. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I personally put mine in my bullet journal, which, oh, that's all weird and crusty because it was been in my backpack. I put mine just in my bullet journal because it's easy to reach for. I can just jot things down. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be anything nice. I keep it messy. Even if you write contemporary, start a style guide. It is so helpful. And if you're an author who is going to an editor, perhaps provide them with a style guide already of what you would like things to look like. So I wrote down all of the proper nouns, the spellings of things that are frequently misspelled, the spaces between them. So for example, in Tibifo, there is hedge witch. Sometimes Wallace would just mush them together, it'd be hedge, no space, which. And from what I was seeing, she wanted it to be hedge, space, which, and she wanted the H to be capitalized. I also was really conscious of nicknames, what is capitalized, what isn't capitalized, all of those things, and just wrote down how I was going to edit those things if I came across them and they weren't consistent. The style guide also included some things that Wallace just generally misspells because I do know her. And these are things that a lot of people do. I have even done them. For example, a lot has a space between the A and the lot. All right, when you put it into actual writing, in a formal sense, it is spelled A-L-L -L space, R-I-G-H-T. It's not A-L-R-I-G-H-T, which is just the slang kind of mushed together version. And numbers up to 100 need to be spelled out fully. And if you're just doing a whole number like 1000, that also needs to be spelled out with words. So there was a lot of variation on the way that witchcraft was talked about. So I did talk to Wallace and ask her specifically which ones and which way that she wanted it to actually be portrayed and how she wanted me to edit them. And even I, the great copy editor, did in fact miss some. It sounds like tedious work and it don't get me wrong, it is absolutely very tedious. However, I love the meticulous way that I can just go through and just fine tune and fix all of the little things that are annoying me, not annoying me, that I can smooth out. I feel good about being able to smooth out someone's manuscript. It feels great. And of course, the most important part of any writing process is you have to set the mood. 
here it is. Very exciting. This book is for October. Wallace's love of using pumpkins, especially since it is a spooky October book, I decided to keep a pumpkin tally. In the end, I found 24 specific pumpkins. And I did not double count pumpkins because you may be saying to yourself, Katie, Katie. You could have just control F for pumpkins. But no, that's not how we did this. Say a pumpkin is referred to in chapter three, then gets mentioned again in chapter five. That only counts as one pumpkin sighting because it's only one pumpkin. It's the same pumpkin getting used, okay? It's not like the actual word pumpkin. We are looking at pumpkin instances in text. Textual pumpkins. <laughs> However, I will say, in one of the chapters, the main characters pick up a bunch of pumpkins to carve from a fall festival. And these pumpkins get a tally then, but then they also get a tally when they are transformed into jack-o'-lanterns. This is a new instance of pumpkin. They have been transformed in some way. I also counted fake pumpkins, including the woolen pumpkin that is used to decorate in the manor in one of the chapters. All pumpkins welcome. Can you tell I love pumpkins? Take a shot every time I say pumpkin. Don't actually. Take a shot of apple cider. Not hard. Now look, if I had counted every instance of pumpkin, there'd have been 122. But no, that is lazy. I also did not count this pumpkin, which is in the title of this. Pumpkin champagne. One pumpkin. Now this instance of pumpkin does not count because she's not actually referencing an actual pumpkin. The pumpkin has not actually made an appearance yet. It is simply a mention of pumpkin, which is not within the rules of this game. Mentioned pumpkins, pumpkins do not count. count. This pumpkin does count because it's yards and yards of pumpkin garlands, which means this is one singular pumpkin instance because they're a they're they're a group of pumpkins in, in a in a garland. I took this very seriously. You can tell. Crystal pumpkin counts. Same crystal pumpkin does not count. It was already counted. This instance of pumpkin is just a description of a box telling us which box it is, therefore not a pumpkin. And my favorite instance of pumpkins, woolen pumpkins. Anyway, I don't know why I got so heated about that. Um, I just thought it was funny, but 24 instances of 24 specific pumpkins. That's what we did, if you were wondering. So that was my experience editing Tipifo. I have a couple extra tips and things to keep in mind to tell you before you hurry on your way to edit your manuscript into something brilliant. Light editing and copy editing. <laughs> is a much different process for me than any other kind of editing. I like to keep in mind, what is the goal of the edit that I'm trying to perform? And I would suggest to anyone who's looking into edit also consider this, especially if it's for another person. I actually personally like to combine copy editing and line editing. I just find that my brain works better that way. And if you're sitting here wondering 
what the actual yeah, fuck is the difference between copy editing and line editing? Here's the answer. Copy editing is general term for editing a piece of text, encompassing mechanics like spelling, grammar, and punctuation. Line editing is a more in-depth version of the copy editing, one that focuses on style as well. Both types of editing aim to produce more readable prose, but line editing is more nuanced. So I overall just call it line editing. This was probably more of a copy edit. Originally Wallace only wanted me to copy edit, but of course I ended up line editing a little bit. The goal of editing Tivifo was very clear and very specific. I was looking for very surface level problems, a misplaced comma, a misspelled word. I was looking for consistency in the way that proper nouns were spelled and ensured that it was kept even and equal throughout the entire book. I was trying to read at about the pace that I normally do when I'm reading like a published book and I'm not really in edit mode and I would only pause if a sentence really tripped me up and I needed to reword it or it made me confused upon the first pass of like, what does this sentence mean? Wallace originally pants this novel and it has gone through many iterations. There have been several sentences that she, while she was writing, she didn't know how they were gonna end. So I would have to then go in, I'd have to switch the syntax to make it actually clear to the reader. What I did focus on is the flow, the pacing, the structure, the characters, or their arcs. I was looking at the book from a purely surface level. Doesn't matter if this book has plot holes, we are beyond that at this point. This is different, however, to how I edit Wallace's short stories. Because they are a shorter bite-sized chunk, I am able to sink my teeth more into them and I can do more edits at the same time. And in general, when I look at other people's drafts, first and second drafts are in a more malleable phase. We're not looking at changing the things at a line level. In this malleable phase, the novel becomes a discussion between author and critique partner. And I personally focus on deeper meanings, themes, and ideas being expressed. And then I also will go in and see how the words themselves are actually conveying or hindering that message. And that's kind of where I get into a little bit of line editing. So I do understand if this is slightly confusing because it sounds like I line edit while I'm developmental editing. However, I usually tend to go in and say, this is something I really like. Keep doing this. Analyze what this is and keep doing it. Because when you're doing something successful, someone needs to tell you so you can try to capture that lightning in the bottle. But grammar, consistency, all of that can be fixed later. Most of it can be fixed with a simple control F. If it can be fixed with control F, I don't touch it. Because truly, what is the point of meticulously editing a paragraph if it's only gonna get cut? So to sum up, what I was doing with Wallace's manuscript is fine detail editing, fine tuning. And I did have to do it quite quickly because we were on a very short deadline, which Wallace was okay with. She told me that was fine. And it was actually probably better that way because she wanted the book to be readable and fast paced. And so I did my best. Finally, my last little nugget of wisdom or advice or my own experience is that like actual writing, each book will be very different and have very different needs. Different books from the same author may have very different editing experiences. So take your time, have your base rules of what you're doing, but don't be afraid to be flexible and move around in your editing process. Don't get discouraged, everything can be fixed at some point. Editing is a lot like layering. So sometimes you just gotta build it, you know? It's, it's we're sculpting from a piece of clay or marble, not going in there with the fine detail work yet. I don't know if any of that made sense. I hope this helped you in some way, or maybe you just laughed at my ridiculous kind of a little bit scatterbrained way of editing. And I hope you enjoyed the autumnal vibes I tried to create despite the fact that I edited this book back in July. Make sure you subscribe if you wanna see more of my rambling face. Click like if you want more craft related videos. I certainly can make more of those. I have many opinions to spout off and ramble about for approximately six and a half minutes. And overall, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.